over to Second Peter. Chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 3. Second Peter 2, verse 1 through verse 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has been idle, not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. We'll start with verse 1. Peter is telling us that there in the time of his writing were false prophets. And he's saying that there will also be false teachers later on in our time frame. So let's think about where do false teachers originate? Where, where does that come from? Well, it comes from Satan, right? We've, we've read before what it says in 2 Corinthians. I'll just read it to you right quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Maybe I'll tell you that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says here, For our... For such are false prophets, verse 13, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, who win will be according to their works. Who are these individuals and where do they originate that are false teachers? Verse 15 there tells us they are his ministers, Satan's ministers. They have transformed themselves to be, as it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Over and over we see the teaching that Jesus gives us, beware of false teachers. Now tell me, how is it that you're going to beware of a false teacher? How will you know if they're false or not? Jason knows. You're going to hold it against God's Word, right? 1 John chapter 4 tells you, 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false teachers, prophets have gone out into the world there are many of them around us today how will you know which one is right or not by testing it according to God's word I don't know if it upsets you but it does me when I hear of these ministers that go on TV go on the radio and make these wild promises to people that they're going to have health and wealth and all they've got to do is send in a little bit of money and God will bless them with ten times what they send in and how many people just willingly give the money. Not testing whether or not it's of the Spirit. Willingly give in. We must as a church learn to test the spirits. There are many false teachers and false prophets among us. Let's look back at Second Peter. I want to show you a few more things. False prophets originate from Satan. He is the false teacher himself. But it says there in verse three or verse two, many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Did the audio get start fixed? It's good. Okay. What does that mean, the way of truth will be blasphemed? Any ideas? The way of truth, let's start with that. What is the way of truth? What would we think of as the way of truth? The gospel. Okay, the way of truth, meaning Christians and the way that they live, 
that way of living will be blasphemed. Now, Loretta, tell us what the word blasphemed means. Sorry. He drew a blank. That's fine. Anybody else help me? What does the word blaspheme mean? Ridiculed. Scoffed. Is that happening today in our society where people have an attitude about Christians that they are hypocrites? Are there many people that view Christians as just people that act a certain way on Sunday, but the rest of the week they don't act that way? How is it possible that they've gotten that attitude? Is it true? Yes. It's because false teachers have come in and they make those that are supposed to be walking along the way of truth. They don't walk that way. I want to just give you an example. Just give you an example of what has happened frequently where I work. A young boy will come in, and we'll talk a little bit, and he'll share with me that uh, he got introduced going to church. Didn't live a righteous life, he was living a, a bad life, but went into church, and because of some reason, maybe others were doing it, and he felt he should, or for some reason he gets saved. And the preacher of the church does not preach holiness, does not preach that they need to separate themselves from the world. And so what does that young boy continue to do? He continues to read inappropriate material. He continues to watch rated R movies. He continues to play violent games. He continues to speak with a filthy tongue. And he has no conviction over it. None. And so what he does is he comes into the facility and I say, how is it you can continue to practice these things? He says, I'm a Christian. How did he get there? How is it that people can walk in such a way that they have no problem watching filth on TV and doing these things, no conviction of the heart, and say, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. It's because they've been deceived. Because preachers don't stand up and teach what it truly means to be a born-again believer. May we not fall into that category. I want to show you a few passages that help us to realize this idea. Look at Ephesians, please. It is so sad when these boys begin to tell me, we are Christians, we're right. And you have to bake them back down to the very principles of God's Word. What is salvation? What is eternal life? Such false teaching is everywhere. And it's being taught in churches. Here's what it says. Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God, verse 1, as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. And verse 6, why does he say this? Let no one deceive you with empty words. What empty words might they give them? That you can continue to practice these things that God says you practice and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's everywhere. 1 Corinthians tells us the exact same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in verse 9, he tells us, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a simple truth. That if you say that you are a believer and continue to practice these things, you are deceived. There is a need, a strong need for discernment amongst Christians. There are ministers that I looked at this week that from behind the pulpit, they encourage 
and rejoice that they watch filth on TV. They think it good that they can relate to the world by the things that they watch and the things that they do. It's saddening to see what preachers preach from behind the pulpit and call it God's Word. On the day of judgment, I'm afraid to see what's going to happen to some of these individuals that are taking the very church of God, the very flock, and leading them to destruction. What's even sadder is that the people that are sitting underneath those teachers are so blind that they don't study God's Word to know the truth from fiction. That they don't get up and leave and say, that is false teaching. To say that you can continue living carnality and call yourself a Christian. Listen, I understand like the rest of us that we do struggle. We are not perfect Christians. We are not people that say we have arrived. But every day we should be struggling against sin, not giving in to it. Feeling contempt as opposed to feeling as though we can condone. We have been deceived. It says in Ephesians, in chapter 5, verse 8, you were once in darkness. Don't forget that. Do not forget that you and I were once in darkness. We are no better than the filthy sinner. We are just like the woman who took and realized that she was a sinner and took a bottle of fragrant oil and anointed Jesus. We're no different than her as a sinner. But what he continues to say, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You once were there. Don't walk like that anymore. Verse 10 says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We're not to have fellowship with darkness, but expose it. It is shameful, verse 12, even to speak of the things that are done by these people in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. There is no reason that someone would have to walk in darkness. Awake from your sleep, and Christ will give you light. That is the condemnation that Jesus speaks of in John chapter 3. He says, This is the condemnation. Verse 19, that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. That's one of the banners that deceptive teachers fall under is the idea of secrecy. If you find in a church that there is secrecy, that they desire not to expose you to the truth and show you everything that goes on within their doings, there should be some red flags that come up. Jesus was very clear when He spoke to His disciples later on in the book of John in John chapter 10, he calls a sheep. In John chapter 15, 
He tells them this, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. All things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Nothing was laid secret. Jesus said, you want to have a relation with the father, I will show you the father. There's no secrets here. Everything the Father speaks to me, I'm going to let you know. And that's what we should be as Christians. We should have no secrets. If you want to see the way I live, you come walk with me. If you want to see what our church teaches, come talk to us. There's no secrets here. That's the way we should be as believers. Let's flip back there to 2 Peter. A couple more things I want to point out. The truth will be blasphemed. There is one avenue that destructive teachers also use in verse 3. What method do they often hit on in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 that causes many people to stumble and fall? Covetousness. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. It's a desire for more and more and more. I want, I want, I want. And so when ministers begin to step up and say, we can give, we can give, we can give, okay, I'll come with you. If you can provide me with a house, you can provide me with my money, you can provide me with these things in the world that I want, I'll go with you. And it's not just here that the writers talk about this. Peter says it and so does Paul in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Paul says the same thing. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but who they serve their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of of the simple. How is it they deceive those hearts of the simple? Smooth words, flattering speech. They appeal to men's flesh and their fleshly senses. You know, there is a desire, oftentimes, myself as a minister that I want to just I want to I want to speak really well I want to just speak real well and I'd like people to just be amazed by how well I can speak you know that's the desire that I have to be aware of but when we think about the writers it wasn't with swelling words that they were preaching Because that's what the false teachers were doing. They had great swelling words and people followed them because they were persuasive in their speech. Paul said, I came to preach the power of Jesus Christ. Not great swelling words. So there'll be times that I won't be very wonderful and eloquent in my speech. And maybe you may come up and speak and may feel as though you're not very eloquent in your speech either. But it's not your speech that's appealing. It's the Spirit of God within you. First Corinthians 13 tells us, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I don't have love, I've become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. It makes no difference how big of words you can say and how wonderful you can say them. If love is absent from the equation... You've got nothing. You've got emptiness. In my study of deception, this is the topic that is seems to be mentioned over and over and over again, dealing with this topic of the end times. Something is going to happen 
that I don't know exactly what it is, but there is going to be a great falling away. There's going to be a deception that goes on that if possible, even the elect could be deceived. And we must be aware of it. Here's what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. We'll start in verse 1 and go all the way to verse 12. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to soon be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. And so he that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know. What is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There is something that's going to happen that's going to cause individuals to fall away, as it says in verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Something is going to happen where people that were supposedly in the faith begin to turn from it and give heed to these deceiving spirits. Look over at Mark chapter 13. Just highlight a few verses for us this morning. Mark chapter 13. This chapter deals with the end times. The disciples ask them, when will these things occur? I want you just to see this, how often this is mentioned. Mark chapter 13, he says in verse 5, Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed. Chapter 13, verse 6. The end says, And will deceive many. Verse 9 at the beginning. But watch out for yourselves. Verse 22. False Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. Verse 33. Take heed and watch and pray. Verse 35. Watch, therefore. And verse 37, the last word, watch. That's what I say to you. It's important as believers that we take heed and watch. Keep your eyes open. Don't slumber in your spiritual walk with Christ. Be like those virgins who when the Savior came had their lamp ready. Not those whose oil had run out and missed it. The last deception I want to give you. Let's look over at Second Chronicles. 
here is what we see. The deception I want you to be aware of is that spiritual knowledge and spiritual wisdom will not save you. Just because you have spiritual knowledge and spiritual wisdom does not mean you are saved. Think about it for a second. Who in Scripture do we know as the wisest man to ever live? Solomon. We're going to look in Second Chronicles about Solomon. And I want to show you a thing or two here. From verse... <clears throat> Start there in verse 22. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his heart. Each man brought his present, articles of silver, and gold, garments, armor, spices, Horses and mules at a set rate year by year. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. So he reigned over all the kings from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores which are in the lowland. And they brought horses to Solomon from Egypt and from all lands. Didn't that seem wonderful? I mean, doesn't that kind of feed your carnality? That King Solomon surpassed all the kings, both in riches and wisdom. Doesn't it feed our flesh from verse 23 when you think that people come to you and seek out your presence so that you can give them some wisdom? Where did he get his wisdom? From God. Verse 23 tells us that. Most of you are aware though from 1 Kings chapter 11. How did Solomon die? The wisest man to ever live. That wrote Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and the book of Proverbs. A book that many of you read frequently. Proverbs, all the wonderful things written in there. Solomon wrote them. How did he end up? First Kings chapter 11. Verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, Women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, and Hittites. From the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, verse 3, princesses. 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. So what do we say of the spiritual wisdom that he was given? Did it save him? No. And neither will it save you. Just because you know the Bible stories, just because you hear wisdom from God's Word, from preachers on the radio or hear... That won't save you. You know, Paul addressed that. Paul addressed Solomon. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 2. 
You know what he says? He says, even though you may have the understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, but not have love, you are nothing. Do you understand that? That even though God may give you all understanding so that you understand mysteries and you have all knowledge, if you do not have love for Jesus Christ, you are nothing. Having eternal life. I'll show you this from John chapter 5. Jesus is speaking in John chapter 5. In verse 37, Jesus says, And the Father Himself who sent me has testified of me. Verse 37, You have neither heard His voice at any time nor seen His form. But you do not have His word abiding in you because whom He sent, Him you do not believe. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. What is he saying there in verse 39? They search the Scriptures and feel that they have eternal life. Because they feel that they know the Scriptures. Because they feel that they have an understanding and knowledge of God's Word. He says, you do not have it. Why do they not have it? Verse 37, because His Word in verse 38 does not abide in them. And in verse 42, because they do not have the love of God in them. It starts with love. Mr. Davidson pointed a wonderful passage a few weeks ago from John chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know Him. The question is, we sing the song, Do you know Him? It's not just a knowledge, it's not just wisdom. Do you have a relationship with God? Do you have communion with Him? Fellowship with Him? That's how you know you have eternal life. It's because you know Him. Not because you just know the Scriptures. One fruit of eternal life. One last fruit that you can check yourself to see. Do you know Him? Last week we looked at Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 7. You remember that the people were God forsaken, desired to promote themselves, do what they wanted, not what God desired. And so God came down in verse 7 and says, Let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. All the people of the world were right here. God confused their language and threw them, scattered them out into what we have today as all the nations of the world. That was the result of a people that were God-forsaken. Of a people who hated God and desired not to please Him. And that is the same characteristic of us today when we are God-forsaken, God-hating people. We will have a tongue, as Ephesians tells us, that speaks foolishly, that speaks corrupt words, that speaks filthy language, that speaks words that put people down as opposed to building them up. That's the tongue that we are born with. 
That's the tongue here that causes confusion and scattering. But let me show you something from Acts chapter 2. There is a different tongue that you may have. I want to show you some parallels between Genesis 11 and Acts chapter 2. The beautiful picture that God painted for us. Genesis 11, confusion, scattering. Acts 2, confusion and unity. And it deals with our tongue. Notice this first from verse 5. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from where? Every nation under heaven. So again, rewind Genesis 11. What did God do? He scattered them all and created every nation that we have today. What's He doing in Acts 2? He's bringing all nations together. Every nation has representation in verse 5. Every one of them. So what happened? Verse 6, when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. What were they confused about? Because each of those individuals heard the people speaking in their own language. And they were amazed, verse 7, and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? What was God doing? He's saying for those that are God-honoring and desire godliness, there is a new tongue for you. In some circumstances it may cause confusion, but in every circumstance it will cause unity. These individuals were given a new tongue. What was the result of their new tongue in Acts chapter 2? Verse 41. Those who gladly received His word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. What happened? When they heard the new tongue... They were saved. What kind of a tongue should we be speaking with today as a believer? Tongue of the learned. Not coarse jesting. Foolish talk. But one who says that we will give an account for every idle word that we speak. We should be people that are using our tongue for Christ. Let no corrupt word proceed of your, out of your mouth, but that which is profitable for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. One sign that we can use to check ourselves if we have the new tongue is how do we speak to others? What's your speech like? 